Uh, I wanted to share with you some of the things that I did um, when uh, I was in Japan with students and so here we go. So Rise in Japan 2016, this was the very first time that the Click program went to Japan. Now I had all gone to other countries beforehand, but for Japan it was the first time. And so I took 15 students from Rice University and they had finished two semesters beforehand um, of Japanese and then they, they were ready and we went. And we went to Japan. We spent six weeks in Tokyo studying the second year material in, in Japan. And they finished, they all survived. As far as I know, they were well. <laughs> <laughs> so lovely Christina is going to give handouts to you. There's only one, one sheet. So students on this program had to sign what we call the language pledge, which basically meant that they, they were only allowed to speak English, um, Japanese, sorry, mm -hmm. Japanese. They could only listen to Japanese music and they could not use any Chinese or English, uh, whatever home language might have been. So out of 15 students, I had three Chinese students and a few Chinese American and Taiwanese American students and one Chinese um, New Zealander student and, and Indian students. So I had a variety, which made it very interesting. But one of the Hindi speaking students, um, he wanted, he found a Hindi speaking family just outside of a uh, palace in Tokyo. So he came to me and he said, Sensei, I really want to talk to that family. I want to know what they think about Japan, but I don't know if they speak Japanese, and I know I'm not supposed to use Hindi or English. So this student came to me and said, I want to talk to this family. And I said, well, good luck doing that. <laughs> In Japanese, dozo, right? And then so he just said, well, would you mind translating for me? So I said, fine. So my student spoke in Japanese and I translated into English because I was the only one that did not sign the language pledge. <laughs> so I was allowed to use English if I needed to. So this I consider to be sort of a semi-emergency case. So I spoke in English and the Hindi family spoke back in English. The student did not need the translation. So that's how it went. So that became also authentic semi, well, I guess it is an authentic data that, that we collected. Somebody, my other student video recorded this conversation, so I'm just going back and forth. That was interesting too. So my students were very dedicated, and they spoke in Japanese as much as they could. And again, there were some, some points where they were speaking Chinese, for example, and I would just go right behind them and say my favorite phrase in Chinese, mei yo mabo dofu. So there's no spicy tofu, that's the only thing I can say in Chinese. <laughs> so I would say, like, my Chinese is improving thanks to you guys. What's wrong with this picture? And then they say, so, sensei, sumimasen, so sorry. Um, yes, Japanese. And so, so it, it was fun, love, um, fun and lighthearted manner, but the students stuck with Japanese the, ent the entire six weeks. Um, so, I thought, oh, my students are doing a pretty good job. I'm so proud of them. And then suddenly, we found ourselves at a sushi restaurant, and one student that was sitting next to me said to the sushi chef, Oh, you honorably do a good job at making sushi. Now, that does not fly. So in, J in Japan, you're not supposed to say, uh, give compliments to a professional by saying, you're good at doing something that you're supposed to be good at doing, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> and on top of that, there is the, the honorific form. <laughs> so here's the honorific form that he, he put, which grammatically, you can appreciate the, the, the path for him to get to this point. But at the same time, it's not quite right, <laughs> right? So. So culturally, you're not supposed to give compliments to a professional in that manner. And then on top of that, by adding this honorific form, it changes the meaning slightly, which basically at this point means you're so good with your words. I know you're giving me compliments, but you're, you're really lying. So, so that, there was like a double, um, not errors necessarily, but, but social, right, <laughs> errors. So, so that became my aha moment. That's something that I, I see a big difference between what the textbook teaches or what the students know and they can logically come to this sentence. But socially, it was not right. So that was that kind of gap that I could find. What was the reaction of 
the sushi chef? <laughs> he just looked. He just looked upset. No, he didn't really look upset, but he didn't have much emotion, you know, expression. But it was more like, like, Mm -hmm. So like, oh yeah, here's a foreigner, you know, speaking <laughs> Japanese, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, a lot of people seem to dislike receiving tips. I don't dislike it, so here we go. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're, if that's your job, and you know, you're, um, it's, it's almost like. Like a reminder that you're you sh you should be doing something better maybe, uh, so that's what some of the taxi drivers told me before. I because I did ask this was years ago, but I said why why do they why do you guys not like receiving tips? And that that was one of the answers that they gave me. Other time they said, oh no, we're not supposed to. So, yeah. So I it, there could be different reasons, but that was one that I got. So okay, so there there was the aha moment. So now I'm sure in your language classes, I'm sure you. There are things, things that your students say or write that just go like, I understand how they got to this point, and I even appreciate that fact. Because this student in particular, he wanted to give compliments because he was like, I am happy with your sushi, right? And so it would have been a little bit better if he did not have the O oh at the beginning honorific form, but he wanted to be polite, right? So that could be some, some teaching, teachable moment right there and then, but also you can maybe think of some um, some ways to, um, to create some activities in which students can really start paying attention to things like that and notice this is not necessarily the way that Japanese people talk. Just one example, does anyone have an example? Um, in Portuguese intervention, yes or no question, you're supposed to repeat the verb. Uh. You just said no. It's like no, end of story, end of conversation. So it's kind of a rude thing. You know, so, so that something like that would be basically in the same line, right, along with this. So those are the sort of the aha moments that I that I started taking notes on. Okay, and we'll come back to that at one point. So, thank you for that. So that's when I thought, well, maybe instead of me telling that student and everyone else, by the way, we don't do that. I thought maybe I'll find some authentic data. So then I thought, well, maybe I'll just give something to, this, uh, to some Japanese people, and then they can give me some compliments about whatever it is that I'm giving. So I thought, well, Godiva chocolate. <laughs> so I brought some Godiva chocolate boxes to, to Japan, and I was giving them to Japanese people. That, but they all just said, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We really like it. But that was it. And uh, so no one really said, like, you're good at doing something, right? I, I can't be good at giving gifts. <laughs> so that didn't quite work out. But anyway, so, so I started thinking, that how do I collect data? So students collect data, that's great. Teacher collects data. I could do that, and I did that, or someone else does the job. So I was thinking, OK, I, I did stalk a lot of people last year. I went after peop total strangers, and I'm like, excuse me, I'm, I'm, I'm a language teacher, and I would like to collect authentic data. And then they were saying, like, what are you trying to look at? And I said, no, I can't tell you. Just everything. So then, so I recorded a lot of total strangers, as well as um, going after my friends and family. And so yesterday we talked about the authentic data, where um, how maybe the, the data that you can get your hands on could be from just this set and not everything else. So, so for that, you could talk to your friends, family members, and say, now you go and collect data. And then that spreads out the wings a lot farther. So I did that. But the things that I could really control was the student collect data. Right? So student co students collect data. That, that's great. But what do you say to the student? So I had to come up with a specific task. So, so here are some examples. And that's, that's on the first page of the handout. So I said, well, we went to, like, say, Tokyo Tower. So talk about your Tokyo Tower trip with your host family. And so that was the assignment, and then write about them. So in some other assignments, I reversed the order. And so as for the students, they were thinking, oh, this assignment is great. It's for speaking practice, and it's only for short forms and the informal, uh, except for one family who's, who basically told one of my students, 
you cannot use short forms as in informal forms with me. We're too old for you, you're too young, so you better use polite forms with me. Other families say, oh yeah, 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 let's, let's be informal, let's be friends. So I had um, an interesting mix, but it was only one family to the rest, 14 families, that basically said, yeah, informal, one family said formal. Um, and then the writing practice, so the students were thinking, okay, uh, we're supposed to use informal here and writing practice, let's use formal. So I gave some specific guidelines for that, and so they worked on that. But what I had in mind, in my, so this was just for me, students didn't see this. The students only saw the task portion. They, didn't, they figured out that they were just practicing the speaking and writing, and that's to the extent of their understanding. I have a question also. You said that you cannot compliment the professional, right? But then, uh, if you want to convey some kind of pleasure, uh -huh. or that you like the appreciation. Thank you. That's happening. a good one. Okay. So, so but there, there must be something that you could say. And that yes, there is. <laughs> so I was observing myself. I was like, like I just detached from myself and going like, okay, now how do I do it? And I had a pleasure of going to a sushi restaurant with Raphael. <laughs> and so we were eating and the, the sushi chef just made really good sushi and I said, ah, uh, it's so delicious, it just melts on my tongue or something like that. And so I was just talking about the product that he had created rather than how he was making it, right? And so those are things that I naturally knew how to do, obviously. But I didn't really think about it when I was, and so if I had grabbed the student right there and said, you don't say that, and instead you do such and such, then maybe I would just come up with something totally different from what's authentic. And although I, don't, I didn't record myself, and I don't think you recorded me saying that to the chef, <laughs> <laughs> but at least I, I recognized that I had done it, right? But so. Well, I'm a Spanish speaker, so I represent my one human being experience represents what everybody does, right? right? And so that's why we rely so much on getting those uh, research papers that can either confirm or deny what we think our own particular practice mm -hmm. uh, represents in a larger context, right? right? And so to get someone to say, well, let's classify these compliments mm -hmm. in Japanese and let's do the research and let's let's figure out what are the trends that are right. that's important. Mm -hmm. so, so going through this stage, I just thought this will be, this will be interesting for me to really look at, look at. not just the, the final particles, because that, that just popped up in my head last semester, but now that I'm starting uh, with larger volume of data, I think this could be one that I can really rel um, start as well. So sometimes the students just bring up topics that you just go like, oh, I didn't really think about it. I didn't realize how important it was or how, how tricky it could be. My students, what they did was they got in pairs and then they got ready for three classes to teach. So they were like substitute teachers in Japan at an elementary school, teaching anything and everything that was approved by me. In so in Japanese, wow. second year Japanese students. So, so they had to come up with some activities but they had to come up with plan A, plan B, and plan C. I wanted to make sure that my students knew that when we're teaching, we don't just come up with plan A. We always have, we always have plan B and plan C, and sometimes even D. So I wanted them to also appreciate my work as well. <laughs> so I said, you need to do this. You don't need to do all three or four in class, but you need to have at least three prepared. So if A doesn't work, you go for B. If B doesn't go, you go for C, and so forth. And, and also, they did not know the word dumb. They knew how to say stupid. That was in the textbook. So they knew how to start a fight, but they didn't know this word, which was aho, which sounds like garlic, right? Uh, 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 aho. <laughs> now, this would, have been, this would have been a short form of dumb. And so in the, according to the textbook that we studied with in the first year, the students knew that in the short form, as a question form, like, are you guys dumb? It would have been just aho. That's the only format that they knew. And then, but that's, that's not exactly how the teacher uh, addressed it. He actually said ahoka, like that. So it's not necessarily just a direct question, like, are you dumb? But it's like, oh, you guys are really dumb, aren't you? So there's that, that um, the tone that s sets this, um, the power relations as well 
coming from the teacher to young children, right? So there is that as well. That, that was not covered in the class, and I don't necessarily think that, that I need to necessarily cover this in the, for the production stage. I don't want my students to be using this to total strangers, and then I find them in the morgue. So, <laughs> so I just said, <laughs> um, but at least it's something to point out, because they would be hearing this at times and go like, what was that? Why didn't the teacher, or why didn't the textbook or, or sensei teach me that it could be the um, question marker from the long form added to the short form? Because that was never covered in the textbook and it's not covered in second or third year textbooks either. But it was used. So that was one. And also, so when I talked about this in class later on, the students said, well, number one, is that okay to, to call students dumb? But we have many degrees of dumb to <laughs> dummy to. <laughs> this was lighthearted, and you could, you could see from the tone of his voice as well as his action. And unfortunately, I can't show you the, the video. Uh, mm -hmm, like, oh, come on, you dummies. But even then, can American teachers get away saying that, right? other things, interaction, body language, and then the language use. So we talked briefly about the grammar and ex expressions, but uh, again, body language should belong to that, sorry. And then the points for improvement for the next activity, which was to go to the nursing home. Uh, the study abroad program, it's designed, of course, to, to teach and lead the students to, to language studies. But at the same time, there's a lot more that you can do with it, especially after you collect data, whether it's the native speaker, native speaker data, or native speakers and students, and sometimes I have student, student data. And whatever you have, um, you've already seen what you can do for language analysis from my colleagues' um, presentations. But beyond the, the language analysis, you can do a lot more, even on the spot. So if you come back to the United States with so much data, there, there's a lot more that you can do with the data. Yes. Um, just listening to you and, and seeing how much we can do abroad with the data that the students collect and how different this can be of the kind of work that we can do here. Mm -hmm. I just wish that I could have worked with the data that my students collected there with them. It's so rich to make them realize what kind of problems they had at mm -hmm. that point. They, they, they didn't know enough to, to understand the mistakes and the miscommunication issues that they had right. at that time. So um, I think one thing that we have to consider for our programs is a way to incorporate the data that we collect in the lessons that we prepare mm -hmm. on site instead mm -hmm. of only of course, this data is super rich for the work that we develop here, but I think it's really important for the students to reflect on the uh, problems and the issues and the, mm -hmm. even the, the, the good part of their communication there on site because right. this can, can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think the students that were there, they got to see themselves interact, and so that was, that was a, a giggling moment, but at the same time, they, they were so proud of what they have done despite the fact that there were some errors that I was pointing out. So, so it can be used in so many different ways, even on the spot. And, and I didn't really realize that until I was there. So I was grateful for this opportunity too. But OK, I'm out of time, so thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>